we're coming toward the end of the series. You heard about Tom Randall coming next week and the following week on the East Campus. And Pastor Brian and I will be filling in in different places to wrap up the series. But we've been studying the book of Acts since September. A year-long study of the church, which is really our story as well. We're excited. You won't want to miss the last couple of weeks of the series. Hopefully you make plans to be here because we have some exciting things planned in addition to the, the guest speaker. But before we jump into tonight's text, let's bow together in prayer and ask God to speak through his word. Father, you told us in your word that it is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, able to divide the thoughts and intentions of the very heart of men and women. And so, Lord, we ask you to speak to us through this living word. We ask you to do so by the one who is the word made flesh, Jesus, in his name. Amen. So over the past few weeks, if you've been with us, we've been following along the account of a particular guy. His name is, anybody remember? Not Jesus, that's the usual church answer. I'll give you a hint. (laughs) Paul, Paul, the apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. We've read about his radical conversion, how he was the greatest persecutor of the faith, and he becomes the greatest champion of the faith. And now, toward the end of his life, we see uh, just <laughs> really a kind of a crazy story from Acts chapter 21, or the middle of chapter 20, through the end of the book of Acts. It's just one cal- calamitous misfortune after another for the Apostle Paul. Almost, you almost can't believe this much happens to one poor guy who's just trying to do God's will. Paul's had more than his share of misfortune. He's headed back to Jerusalem, and now we pick up the story after Jerusalem, he's on his way to Rome. He's experienced prison, riots, trials, persecution, attempts on his life, and now he's on board a ship and he's sailing to Rome because he's appealed his case to Caesar. He realizes he's not going to get a fair trial in Judea and in Jerusalem, and so being a Roman citizen, he appeals his case to Caesar, and thereby, for by law, he has to go to Rome to stand before Caesar. And you'll hear about the, the trials that sent him there next week when Pastor Brian, or actually, you won't next week, you'll hear Tom Randall, who knows what he'll say, but it'll be good. But it's almost as if Acts 21 to 28 is one long, complicated account of the misfortunes of this, this man, Paul. Now, on board the ship are sailors and soldiers. They're responsible for his safe delivery to Rome to stand before Caesar, as well as a few of his companions, including Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles or follow on the screen, Acts chapter 27 read the first couple of verses of the story here. And when it was decided that we should, we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some of the other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramitium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. So why read this little text here? You notice where it says, when it was decided that we should sail for Italy. Who's we? Luke is writing this account. He's not quoting the Apostle Paul. He's with him on board this ship. So he's been in and around the events in in Jerusalem and Paul's trial before Felix and Festus, two Roman governors that came after Pontius Pilate, and before King Agrippa. And now he's sailing along as sort of a friend to go along with him, even though Paul's under arrest, to go to Rome. And he's on his way there. And uh, at first, they sail along rather smoothly, Near the shore of Cyprus, you can read about that in the next few verses. And they end up changing ships. And then things begin to get worse. Let's pick up the story in verse 13. Read through verse 32. Now when the south wind blew great gently, supposing they, that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind, called the Northeaster, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind... We gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempests lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me, and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. 
And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. We'll stop there. Now, it's a complicated story. And there's a lot of, uh, even prior to this, there's like landmarks given and exactly where they sailed and where they were pushed by the storms. And, you know, Luke was a physician, so Luke was into details. And those details are given to us for a reason. Sometimes when we read the Bible, I think we can make the mistake of thinking, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that is it really important to understand or to know. Why are those details given to us? Uh, Jesus said, or actually John said in his gospel, if all that Jesus said and did were to be written down, there wouldn't be enough books and libraries of the world to contain it all. So I think we can assume that God gave us a, a, a small cross-section, an intentional amount of the scripture. In 19th century, an experienced Scottish yachtsman named James Smith made a careful on-site study of this very narrative, part, the part of which we just read. He asked experienced Mediterranean sailors what the mean drift of a ship of this kind would be in such a gale. He learned that it would drift about 36 miles in 24 hours. Even today, the soundings mentioned in verse 28 indicate the ship was passing Kura, a point on the east coast of Malta, on her way into St. Paul's Bay, what it's called today. Smith calculated that a ship leaving late in the evening from Cauda would by midnight of the 14th day be less than three miles from the entrance of St. Paul's Bay. In other words, he did modern... Uh, <laughs> Uh, investigative nautical research to find out is this accurate and found out to within th two or three miles it's accurate account during such a storm. He also reported that no ship can enter St. Paul's Bay without passing within a quarter of a mile from the point of Cora where the sailors would have heard the breakers thus surmising they were nearing the land as Luke reports to us in, Acts, or in verse 27. Pretty amazing, isn't it? You'll see a map image here on the screen uh, that shows the, the route. Hopefully you can see that red line. The sailors had intended to sail along the coast, the, the islands of the Greek islands, and up, the, up into the Adriatic Sea there to Rome. They were blown off course, what they thought, who knows where. They ended up, in God's providence, to be on the island of Malta, which was a short distance from land. We'll come back to that in a minute. But the heart of this story is not the route they took or what happened to the ship. It's the storm. And it's what happens in and through the storm. The storm is referred to as a northeaster, and it was so violent the crew of the ship had lost all navigation and control. They, did, they, had, they didn't have any stars navigated by, no sun, no stars. They didn't know which direction they were going. They began to jettison their cargo, even the tackle, basically just with the mercy of the wind and the waves, were holding on for dear life. And eventually we read that they abandoned all hope of survival. No idea where they're going, no way to control the ship, throwing everything that they didn't absolutely need overboard and just hoping beyond hope that they might run aground and survive somewhere. Now, there are lots of stories in the Bible about storms at sea. You might remember the story of Jonah. There are stories about the disciples in storms on the Sea of Galilee. And I think each time we read those stories, there's the, the storm itself is a real historical account, but we're also given that as sort of a metaphor for the storms of life, for how we respond in our own storms, even if they're not at sea. Our lives, when suffering and disappointment come upon us, to the point where we feel like we're out of control, we have no navigation, right? I'm not sure which way to go. I'm not even sure which way is up. And I feel at the mercy of circumstances and whatever's happening. And how Paul deals with his storm, or more specifically, how God deals with Paul in his storm, I think can really be a great help to us when our storms come, because they will. The first lesson is that God is sovereign over the storm. I want you to pay attention to that. God is sovereign over the storm. Notice in verses 22 through 25, I'll read them again. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men. 
for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. Now that's an interesting thing for Paul to say. Paul is saying in no uncertain terms, God has spoken to me and none of you are going to die. Don't worry. It is already established. It is predetermined. It is absolutely in God's sovereign control that you will not perish. He's revealed it to me. Trust me on this. Not wishy-washy, not maybe, but God has said it's going to be this way. Now look at verses 30 to 32 again. So keep that in mind, right? Paul says, don't panic. Despite how it looks, it's an absolute certainty that you will not die, right? Let's look at verses 30 to 32. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, so right, they're, they're pretending to lay out anchors, but basically they said, we're getting out of here. Paul said, verse 31, to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Paul says, unless you do this, you can't be saved. Does anybody feel any tension there? Anybody hear like a problem in those two sections? On the one hand, it's an absolute certainty, no matter what happens, you'll be saved. On the other hand, unless you do such and such, you won't be saved. You see any conflict? Any contradiction? If you're not nodding, you're not listening, you're not paying attention, or you're, right? What, right? Well, which is it? Is it an absolute certainty that they will be saved and no one will die? Or is it depend on what they do? That's, I think, a question that plagues a lot of us, if we're honest. How can God absolutely guarantee that all will be saved and at the same time say, unless you do this and this, you won't be saved? This is a problem for us because we're either or people as human beings, aren't we? Either God's in control and he's sovereign or it's up to me and my actions and my decisions. This is the mystery of God's sovereignty. What Paul is saying here and what the Bible everywhere consistently affirms is that God is absolutely 100% in control. He is sovereign over all things and at the same time our choices and our actions and decisions have real consequences. They really matter. What you and I tend to think of as contradictory ideas, the Bible asserts are actually parts of a, two parts of a perfectly coherent whole. And if you want an example of this, go back to Acts chapter 2. This won't be on the screen, but you can turn there with me if you like. I'll read a portion of this. Acts chapter 2, Peter's great speech at Pentecost, sort of the beginning of the church, what began the whole movement. And in Peter's speech to the Jews, verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Verse 23, listen to this. This Jesus... Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of guilty men. Let me say that again. This Jesus, delivered up by the absolute definite plan and foreknowledge of God. What is that saying? It was planned. It was planned. It was foreknow God's foreknowledge and determined plan. Jesus was going to die for the sins of the world. That was the, a plan before the foundations of the world were laid. So those who killed him were just acting even unconsciously according to the will of God, Right? God planned it. And then Peter says, yet those who killed him were guilty, lawless, accountable for their actions. You see a conflict there? This is the predetermined, foreordained plan of God. And yet you, you are accountable for your actions that carried out this preordained plan. How do those things go together? That's what Paul is saying in a sense. Those who crucified Jesus were acting according to the sovereign plan of God, and yet they're also guilty and responsible for their evil actions. There are countless examples of this in Scripture, and it's hard for us to get our minds around. I'm, I'm explaining why it's important. We would prefer it to be, be one way or the other. Either God's in control or we are. Or maybe it's 50-50, right? If I do my part, he does his part. That's a common myth, I think, among a lot of people. If I just do my part, then God sort of comes alongside and says, good job, I'll take it from here. But Paul seems to say, and the Scripture seems to say, it's 100% God's sovereignty and 100% your responsibility. Theologians call this compatibilism. In fact, the, the, the sovereignty of God is perfectly compatible with the responsibility of men and women, even though we can't reconcile that perfectly in our tiny brains. In fact, 
for those of us who say, look, I, I don't like this idea of sovereignty. I've had people say this to me. I'm not, I mean, I think God you know, can do certain things, but he lets us handle our own lives. Really, I'm in control of my destiny. I'm making my future. I, don't, I think it creates people who are passive. and It's not a good idea to think about God as in control. If we really understood the implications of being in total control of your own life, I and mean, if, that, if that could actually be true, if you could be in total control of your own life, if you could get your brain around what that meant, you'd be terrified by the idea. You and I would be horrified by the prospect of that. You wouldn't want that job. I think there's two extremes and two responses. For those that think, I'm the captain of my own soul, I determine my own fate. When you get right down to it, there's a, it leads to panic. Because you realize at some point when the storm comes, I can't manage this. I can't navigate this. I can't control this. Or if you think, God's absolutely control and I have nothing to do with it. Christian fatalism. That leads to passivity. Right? I don't have a part to play. I just sit back and see what happens. Panic or passive. Paul is neither, is he? There's a lot of P's in this little part of the preaching. <laughs> So if, if, if I'm in control, it leads to panic. If God's in control, it leads to passivity. But Paul is poised, to use a P word. He is, isn't he? he, he I mean, he's the guy in chains, and he's the dominant figure outside of God in the story. 276 people on board. We know that from the estimates of what the, the, number of the sail, crew of a ship that size and the, and the regiment of the soldiers and the names listed, give or take. And Paul's the guy who's poised in the midst of it all. Where does that come from? Well, for one thing, it's his third shipwreck. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He lists all the things he's been through. He's, this is not the first time. Not his first rodeo. He's been shipwrecked before. He's seen God come through before. But I think he understands that it's bigger than this moment, than this storm. God is sovereign over this. And that leads us to the second point. God is working through the storm. God's working through the storm. So let's ask the question, why does God allow storms in our lives? There's two passages, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament I want to talk about that I think will help give us some perspective. But to, to, to understand the Old Testament reference, I have to tell you a little bit of the story. We don't have time to read it all. Go back and read Genesis 37 through J chapter 50, and you'll get the story of Jacob and Joseph and Jacob's sons, right? Anybody ever see the play J Jacob, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? Jacob's sons, right? That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but it's a fun play. So Joseph is the youngest of his brothers, and, it's a, and, and he's the favorite of mommy and daddy. And as we all know, when parents play extreme favorites, it leads to resentment and bitterness and dysfunction, and this family is archetypal in that sense. His brothers hate him. And one day, they, and Joseph, for his part, doesn't exactly handle their favoritism very well. He's sort of puffed up with it and kind of, kind of an annoying naivete and thinks he's all that. And one day he and his brothers are out in the fields far away and there's a caravan of, of slave traders coming and they sell Joseph into slavery. They take his robe that his father had given him, the, the, a coat of many colors, they cover it in animal blood and they tell their dad this story that he was killed by a wild animal. Now, fast forward the story. Joseph, that's, not the, that's not the worst thing that happens to Joseph. It's close, but he, he goes from bad to worse. He ends up uh, in, in prison, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He's, uh, he's beaten and he's in prison. And, but all these things, if you read through the whole story, there's this misfortune, sold into slavery, falsely accused, ends up in prison. Eventually, he comes to be the second highest rank in Egypt. And he saves his family and thousands, countless thousands of Egyptians from this famine in the land. It's an amazing story. This, this young man sold into slavery Rises up into Potiphar's house, a, a, an Egyptian official, falsely accused by his wife, ends up becoming number two in the, in the land, second to Pharaoh, and saves thousands of people, including his own brothers and his father and his family from this famine. So, what do we make of that? It was okay then, right? It's okay then that his brothers sold him into slavery, because if they hadn't done that, he never would have risen to this position and been in the perfect spot to save all these people, including his family, and preserve the line. No, it was not okay. It was not okay. In fact, what we read in Genesis 50, verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers when they are afraid that he's going to finally take his revenge after the famine, after all is said and done, Joseph says to them, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. That's it in a nutshell. 
No, it's not okay that you did this. It was wrong and it was wicked. It was sinful. But God is sovereign and he's working through it. He didn't cause it. He didn't make those brothers sell their brother into slavery. But he's bigger than that. He's able to, in his sovereignty, encompass even our wicked actions, even storms, even evil. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who we're talking about here, wrote in Romans 8, 28, For we know that all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That often gets misapplied. It's not some Christian way of saying, you know, um, every cloud has a silver lining. Just look for the good in every situation. It's not what he's saying. It means that all things, even the wicked things, even the things that bring suffering and pain, even things we can't understand, ultimately, in the end, work together for the purposes of God and for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God is able to overcome all of the evil and wickedness in the world eventually and use it to accomplish exactly the opposite of the evil it was intended for. And if you doubt that, look at the cross. Look at the cross. All of the evil in the world came crashing down in that moment. And God reversed it. We'll come back to that. By the way, there's no promise given to us anywhere in Scripture that you and I will see how these things all work out, that we'll understand in our lifetime or experience how these things all work out. I wish there were. And I've been with people who are in the midst of their storm. And they want badly to say, well, it's because of this. Maybe. Not all of us get to be like Joseph and see it all come full circle. Many of us won't know that till the other side of eternity. A family from our church, um, they're dealing with the imminent death of their mother, mother of the, the mother of the wife in this family. And I went to visit them in Delmar Hospital. And they're grieving and sharing stories and reminiscing, and I prayed with them. And I got a call from them the next day. I didn't know. Like, is she going to die this day, next day, this week? I thought well, this might be it. It wasn't the call I thought it was. They said, you need to come. There's a family two doors down from my mother who doesn't know Jesus and are facing the same thing with their father, and they want to speak to someone from our church. Why? Because they're watching this family, how they deal with grief, and saying that's different than what we have two doors down. What's going on over there? Now, does that mean that God struck down their mother to reach this family? No. God is sovereign over the storms in our life. He's working through them to bring about his purposes and will, even if we don't get the privilege of seeing how it all works out in our lifetime. But we can still trust that it does work out. How do we do that? How? How do you and I trust that it works out, that it works together for good? By focusing on the cross, as I mentioned a moment ago. The death of Jesus accomplished victory over sin and death and led to life for all who trust him. Now, I, I know that I'm not saying that demons and uh, the devil has conversations like in my head. That sounds weird, but bear with me. But I've often wondered, like, if there are conversations in hell, what, did it, what was the conversation like when they realized that they, they, thought, they thought they won? Right? What, was the, what was the debate like when they realized, finally, we won, we killed God on the third day? What was the conversation like? Wait, what? How can this be? We, the very thing that they thought they'd accomplished, evil thought had won, God turned it around. And Paul says, victory over the grave, over sin, over death, and it becomes the passageway to life for all who trust him. So God is sovereign over the storms. He's working through the storms. And finally, he's present in the storm. He's present in the storm. Not only is God sovereign and at work in our storms, he's also personally present with us. Look at verse 23. And I really hadn't noticed this, honestly, before. I hadn't paid attention to this part of the text before studying for the sermon. Um, you, know, you know how you read things. You're sure you've read them. I've read the book of Acts numerous times. But it's never caught something before. That, by the way, that continues to happen to me. I hope it continues to happen to you. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, once remarked about his, uh, having finished reading the Bible for the 200th time, and one of his students asked him if he still found things new after 200 readings through the Bible. He says, oh, on every page. Isn't that a great line? On every page. Leave it to Lewis. Anyway, verse 23. 
For this very night, Paul speaking here, there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. I want to pause on that phrase. For this very night, there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. To whom I belong. This is absolutely crucial, I think, for us in storms. Paul says, I belong to him. I'm his. He has absolute authority over my life. I lay myself completely in his hands. I'm not trying to control my circumstances. I'm at his mercy. I belong to him. You know, I, I've known people who have been through their share of storms and suffering, and you can tell when someone has, has, been, has come out the other side and they're deeper and they're softer and they're, uh, they have a, a, a more intense faith, a more real, palpable sense of the reality of Jesus. Do you know people like this? that it's been through, If you've been around people that have never suffered, lived sort of a charmed life or just been fortunate enough to this point, I'm not saying we should seek suffering, but I think very often, my experience is, those people are shallow. It's not that we should go out and try to find suffering to deepen our lives, but when you're around men and women who have been through the storm and come out the other side and they have a, they have a stronger grasp of the reality of God, their faith has grown through it. But we, we have to be honest, storms do not automatically make us deeper, more loving, more peaceful, more faithful people. I also have known people who have been through the storm and they become bitter, hardened, The same sun which melts wax also hardens clay. It has everything to do with how we respond in the storm. It all depends on how we respond. In verse 23 and 24, Paul is no doubt connecting the dots back to his experience in chapter 23, verse 11. If you were here a couple weeks ago, we preached on this when he's in prison in Jerusalem. And and God comes and stands near him. Verse 11, 23 verse 11, it says that the Lord came and stood near him and said, take courage. Same thing here. Paul is connecting the dots back to that experience and saying, this same God is with me now that he was with me then. When we're in the storm, we must look to him. If you have your Bibles, it's not on the screen, but flip to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and following. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We look to who? Jesus. It sounds so simple, but it's so hard to do, isn't it, when the storm comes? We want to look to the doctor, to a family member, to a friend, to some, something else, someone else. I remember when my father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer years ago. He's still, my mother-in-law has passed away from pancreatic cancer. My father-in-law is still fighting his battle. They would be on WebMD constantly. I think WebMD is the devil, right? Just... Oh, we can understand and make sense of it and experimental medications and those. That's all good and God can use that. We must look to him. But you really can't look to him if you don't believe that he's present, if he's, that he's real. Again, how do you know that he's with you? The gospel. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says something very interesting. He says that the, the, no sign will be given to those who want a sign except for the sign of Jonah. Well, what does he mean? What is the sign of Jonah? He says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the, in the belly, heart of the earth. And one, then he says, one greater than Jonah is here. It's a little bit cryptic. I think we can get the reference, right? Three days, three nights. We understand that part. But what, why Jonah of all the references? What does Jesus say? One greater than Jonah was here. Well, you know the story of Jonah, right? God wants him to go. He doesn't want to go because of his racial prejudice. He won't go to Nineveh. Then he's out on board a ship running away, and a storm comes. And Jonah looks and says, this storm has my name on it. And he tells the sailors, throw me overboard into the, let me be, the only hope you have is that I'm consumed by the storm, right? Jonah's basically saying, you're going to perish with me. 
The only chance you've got is to cast me into the storm, let that consume me, and then you can be set free. You see the connection now? Jesus is one greater than Jonah is here. He didn't run from the storm. He ran to it. And our only hope of salvation and freedom is that the storm would overwhelm him. The storm meant for us. The storm that we deserve, the storm of God's wrath, because none of us are deserving of salvation. Jesus says, I endured that. So in other words, the only storm that can ultimately ever really sink you is the storm of being apart from God because of your sin. And Jesus says, I endured that. I endured that. Endured the cross, scorning its shame, Hebrews says. I went through that storm so you won't have to. And I'm with you in these smaller storms that come your way. I know, I know that it's easy to... If, if life is smooth sailing for you right now, it's easy to believe this or understand this. But when the storms come, it's my prayer that we would trust that God is sovereign over them. He's working through them even if we can't see it. And he's present in them. I remember the hymn of, a, of one of my grandmother's favorite songs, Be Gone Unbelief, My Savior is Near. His love and time past forbid me to think. He'll leave me at last in trouble to sink. By prayer, let me wrestle that he will perform. With Christ in the vessel, I smile in the storm. Let's pray. And then Jordan has a very, very powerful song, which I think will put an exclamation point on all of this. Lord Jesus, you are the rock of our salvation. You are unshakable, unsinkable, immovable. Let us cling to you. As the book of Hebrews tells us, you are the hope that's an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. Let us look to you, not only when the sun is shining, Lord, but in the storm. For those of my friends who are in the midst of their own storm, God, fix their eyes on you. Let them know that you're sovereign over it, you're working through it, and you're present in the midst of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.